We gave them, we put them back. Don't even use them. <laughs> so we can take so, one too? Yeah, you can take one if you like. Be careful with it, it's precious. <laughs> no, don't take pictures of it. No flash photography. <laughs> So, at this time, we're going to go to the Lord for the worship of His Word. Amen. So, locate, please, Mark chapter 8. The writing is nice. You can read, you can read that. I don't know about the pen so much. Well, you, can, you can write with it, brothers. I was teasing. <laughs> oh, I tell you, we're passing it around to look at it. No, I thought you were asking for it. Oh, no, you can't take that from me. They would gather there and have what 
similar to a church service and offer sacrifices, sometimes human sacrifices, to these demons. This location right here is the church for pain. This, this is a hole, or maybe this is the hole. Again, I have a hard time to, have a hard time figuring out which is which. That's what I was talking to you about. Can you, you can't see that? Yeah, no, but that's what I was talking to you about. That. Yeah, no. it's, it's a cave. Yeah, this cave. Yeah. This cave, this is the cave of pain, or the gates of hell. This is called the Gates of Hell. It's also called the Cave of Pain. They would take humans and throw them into this cave and they would fall. For so that Pan, who is a half human, half goat, and there's up they have dancing goats, and Pan also plays the flute according to their legend. But Pan would accept the sacrifice. And if they accept he accepts the sacrifice, then they would have a good crop that year, and their cattle, their sheep, would reproduce, and they were able to make a lot of money off of their their livestock. If Pan does not accept their sacrifice, then Pan works against them until they offer an acceptable sacrifice. If Pan works against them, then the, the rain don't come, and their crops do not produce well. Their sheep do not produce well. So to get a good crop so they can make money that year, they would continue to kill people by throwing them alive into this cave. So the gates of hell is seen as a place of torment, a place of offering sacrifices to the demons. Right. So the gates of hell is not a good, good idea. The gates of hell is not a good place. That's what they, they believe it? Yes, that's one of their religions. Right. That's the people who worship the demon called Pan. Again, Pan, is, they believe, is a half-human, half-goat. And he plays the flute to seduce people with the sound of the flute. Where do you find out all about this? I ain't going to read that. In, it's in several it. commentaries. Oh, it ain't in the Bible? No, sir. It's a, it is a commentary. The people wrote that they did the history and the research about this area called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, yeah. And this is a religion that's taking place during the time that Jesus and his disciples are walking up to this location called Caesarea Philippi. That cave is in the town Caesarea Philippi. And this is the first thing is a half goat and half human, you say? Yes. Sir. Is that supposed to be real or is that just something somebody's made up or what? Well, they, the people in that religion believe it's real. They believe that it is a real being that is half goat, half human. Isn't that like a Greek god or something? Yes, it is a, a Greek god. Well, he's not, he's not a Greek god, right? But it's similar to the Greek god. I mean, they make these gods, you know, and build them and stuff, you know. And they, I just wondered if it was something like that instead of some real. From what I understand, he is not a physical being, okay. but it's what they uh, believe in. They believe in him. He's, he's a spiritual being that they believe in and they're afraid of. Kind of like, you know, the in America, the Native Americans, which we call them American Indians, they have different gods that they believe in. They believe there is a god that drags the sun across the sky. They believe there's a god of the, the snow. They believe there's a god that, of war that they have to appease. It's kind of like that. Even though they can't physically see their gods, they believe in the spiritual gods. Well, that's what this guy Pan is. He's a spiritual god. He's invisible. This word, Pan, where did it come from? It's P-A-N, Pan. Pan, it's, yeah. No, it's Pan. It's you know, Pan. Over, in the, over there in Europe, you know, that, what you call it, the A-E-I-O-U is pronounced different. Yes, it is. The vowel. You know, the vowel. A is 
demonic. They, they are fighting against it. They, the Jews are surrounded by all kinds of pagan religions. Mm -hmm. But the reason I bring this one up is because Jesus brings it up. Yeah. He talks about the gates of hell. Yeah. Is that place still there? Yeah, you can go there now. You can go there today and look at it. It's in the town of Caesarea Philippi. Well, thank you. Now, this picture is recent. Uh, I, I think this picture was taken in uh, 2001 or something. I don't remember. Okay. No, but I don't, I don't really know. Something might throw you in there. <laughs> they got it. They got it guarded off now, so you can't, can't get, get to it. There's a fence around it, so you can't get over there and, and fall in or push somebody else. It is. No, I, I just read about it. <laughs> well, they don't practice that today, No, they don't practice. This is not an act of religion today. Thank God. The religion died out. Shortly after what we read in the scripture today, this religion died out shortly after. There's more to it, and we're going to talk about the gates of hell more when we get there in the, in the scripture, but that's the reason I'm pointing it out so you'll understand a little bit better what's happening when we read the scripture. Now, there are parallel passages we're not going to have to look at as we know, the story of Jesus' life takes place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. We get a better picture of what's happening when we look at all of them together. Well, this section is in Matthew chapter 16, it's in Luke chapter 19, and it's in Mark chapter 8. 19. Okay, not the one that you got there. Oh, I'm sorry. Luke 9. I don't know what I was thinking. Thank you. Luke 9. Okay, so Mark 8, 27 through 30. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And Luke 9, 18 through 21. So let's read out of Mark first, and then we're going to go to Luke and Matthew. Let's begin reading in 8, 27. And we looked at this last week. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and, he, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Isn't that fitting time for us to think about that when the Easter is coming up? That he should be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. But when he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what you were mentioning earlier. Yeah. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save him. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in the adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father 
with the holy angels. Now let's look at Luke chapter 9. Yes, they do. We'll get a little bit different perspective with each one. Mm -hmm. Okay, Luke chapter 9, began reading with verse 18. And it happened as he, that's Jesus, as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. You see, that's something different. Mm -hmm. In Mark, we didn't see that Jesus is praying. But here, Luke points out that Jesus was in prayer. <coughs> He was alone praying, and his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So this question is birthed out of prayer. In Mark, we don't get to see that, but Luke does point it out that Jesus was in prayer. So through prayer, Jesus decides to ask them, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. And he said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Daily. Mark doesn't say daily, but Luke does. Take up his cross daily and follow me. That means that we have to make a recommitment every day. This isn't the... Once saved, always saved idea of just, well, I shook the preacher's hand one time 75 years ago, so I'm okay. So this is a daily commitment that we must do to Christ, a daily commitment. And this isn't just about salvation. This is about being willing to be committed to him every day. We make the recommitment to pick up our cross and follow him. Not that our cross brings salvation. It's His cross that brings salvation. But because of His cross, we take it, we take up the cross and follow after Him. What does that mean, take up the cross and follow after Him? Does that mean that we must go be nailed yeah. to a tree? We've got to serve Him every day. We have to serve Him every day. Follow His, His ways, not ours. Follow His ways, not ours. When, when he's talking about taking up the cross, you know, when he took up the cross, he gave his life on the cross. We have to give our life spiritually to him. We have to let the old man die. Right. Let the old man just die. Like he put, just like he died on the cross, we have to let our old man die on the cross every day. That's why we're taking up the cross. That's why we're, we're giving ourselves every day to the old man back. And killing him on the cross so that the new man can live. Right. Just like Brother Al said earlier, you right. can't live on the fence. Yeah. And a lot of people today, unfortunately, okay, think, well, if I accept Jesus Christ, he loves me as I am. Yes, he does love you as you are. But he wants you to follow him. And Jesus doesn't go out there and on through Monday through Saturday live like the devil and then on Sunday become Jesus. That's right. You're to live like him every day. Every day. We are not to just choose a day. Every minute of every day we are to crucify our flesh and live his way, not ours. The thing is that right. we're we're human. That's and true. Every day we are going to be human. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And not every day we're going to be, hey, I'm full of the Spirit. That's and right. I can put hands on someone and deliver them. It doesn't work that way. That's it's right. Days that we're, and and, and the, the unique way that the Lord is so perfect that, that, he, that he built us is that your body language. 
language, your reaction, demeanor, your character speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. so you, get up, you, you can you say you're the best Christian in the whole world, but I'm seeing that you're evil. Right. Because God gave me the knowledge to see that. Just like you can see the cleanness of a spiritual person inside me. I don't know about you guys, but when I go out into the world, and not judging, because that's not my job, right. but I see evil in people. I see mm -hmm. the devil literally living in people. You can see right through their face that they have no or anything good in, in them. And it's sad. And we have to we have to pray for them and say, Father, have mercy on them, mm -hmm. deliver them, and keep going. But when we look at them and we judge them and we say things about them that are uh, in the human in the human way, we're just being just as bad as they are. That's right. Because That's right. if not even worse, because we know better. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. That's right. Amen. So we have to realize that. When we're feeling down and out, that you feel, hey, go to the front, get prayer. If you haven't prayed, if you feel that you're falling, that you no longer want this yet, you got to be strong and let that spirit bring you forward and, and, and repent so that the Lord can. We do need to be committed to Him every day. And you're right that some days we're going to be more sensitive to the Spirit than others. Some days we're going to be struggling with our own flesh. It seems that our flesh is stronger than other days. Galatians 5.16, you got to walk by faith. you got to walk by faith. And these guys, the disciples, remember they're living in a Roman-occupied territory. Roman crucified people. They never crucified Roman citizens. It was illegal for Rome to crucify a Roman citizen. But people that were not Roman citizens, they would crucify them as a way of punishment. When they would, when they would get the, what we would call the electric chair or the lethal injection, when instead of lethal injection, they give them the cross. It's the death penalty for their crimes. Jesus is not the first person to ever be crucified. Jesus was one among millions of people that Rome was crucified. He had two people beside him. And he had two people beside him. So Jesus was between two people that were crucified. They crucified people on a daily basis. Right. Jesus is just one of many. But it, so it is not that the crucifixion is not the thing that saves us. It's that Jesus is the Son of God. The Christ, that's what saves us. Mm -hmm. And he was crucified in our place. We deserve that type of punishment. We deserve that type of shame. We deserve that type of ridicule. But he took it on himself so that we wouldn't have to. So when Jesus tells them that you must take up your cross daily and follow me, they would have in their mind the image of one walking to the hill. They would have their in their mind, they would be able to picture mm -hmm. the people they've seen hundreds of times walking down the road with people gawking at them and yelling at them and making fun at them with their crime being chanted, this person was a thief, this person was a child molester, this person was a rapist, this person did this thing or that bad thing. Mm -hmm. Their crime is known, so they would be put to shame and public ridicule. So when they hear this, that you must pick up your cross daily, what they are hearing is, you must be willing to be put to public ridicule for me. You must be willing to be put into public shame for me. You must be willing that everything you've done, done wrong will be put on public display. A lot of times Christians get all offended. Oh, I'm tired of them judging me constantly. I'm tired of people seeing what I do. I'm tired of living in a glass house, so to speak, with people constantly watching me, waiting on me to mess up. But Jesus said that's going to happen. You're going to have to pick up your cross and follow him. I've heard people say that, oh, this is my wife, now you see the cross I bear. This is my son, now you see the cross I must bear. That is not 
the cross that That's we right. bear. Amen. Our spouse is a blessing. Our Amen. children are a blessing. Those are not the crosses that we must bear. To say that, I know people say it in a joke, but it's actually not an appropriate joke because the cross that we bear is the shame that we bear for the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. It is not the blessing he give us and that is not the cross. The cross is the judgment of others against us. The cross is the, the pettiness of us as we humble ourselves for him. It is the the shame that we bear for his name. Not the shame that we bring on ourselves. If I go out here and do something wrong, I bring shame on me. That's not the cross I bear. The cross I bear is for people looking at me and looking down on me because I serve him. That's the cross to bear for him. When people judging us wrongly because as we serve him. Jesus did not deserve the cross. So when people judge Christ, judged Christ, they said he deserved the cross because he was a blasphemer. He cannot blaspheme against God because he is the Son of God. He is equal to God. So when they would look at him and say that he deserves the cross, they are judging him incorrectly. So the cross that we bear is when people look at us and judge us incorrectly, saying that we deserve the punishment that belongs to Him. Amen. We deserve the identity that belongs to Him. We deserve the shame that belongs to Him. Because He took our shame upon Himself. So when we hear people say that it's the cross that I must bear, Unless they're using it to glorify Christ, then they don't understand. Or they're just making a poor joke. They, at least that joke does not understand. What that means is that we must bear the cross for Jesus. To pick up our cross daily is to be willing to pick up that shame. And that also means that we don't defend ourselves. We looked a few weeks ago where when they spit on Jesus, he didn't even turn his face when they spit, in, spit on his face. He didn't even turn his face away. He didn't hide his face from them, but he bore it. Christ despised the cross, but he embraced it for you and me. We know we don't have to enjoy the punishment from others. We don't have to enjoy people looking down on us. We can despise that, but we must embrace it for Him. God is the uh, God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine, and the wood of it. It's up to us if we want to give good fruit or bad fruit. Bad fruit, we take the branch down for it to fire and burn it. That's right. We are His branches. We're supposed to produce fruit for Him. Good fruit. You can produce bad fruit. We're supposed to produce With good fruit. The bad fruit, the branches that give bad fruit, you kind of throw them away and burn. Kind of throw them away, you know, like you do a tree when it gives bad leaves. You trim it away, cut it, and throw it away. And he will do pruning on us. Yeah. And he will, a lot of times, imagine that tree would hurt if it had feelings. I don't know if trees have feelings or not, but I, I doubt it does. But if it had a nervous system like we do, when you cut that, those branches off, it would have to hurt. It hurts us when we go through pruning, but we must submit to that so that we can grow with him, so that we can be shaped and beautiful the way he wants us to be. Well, on that note, I've actually read an article recently that they have, scientists have found that plants a different type. They actually have a response um, to getting cut. They have a response to getting, you know, the getting um, broken. There is a response in the tree or plant system that responds to that pain, if you will. That uh, it's not in the same way we would respond to it, but they are responding in their 
self, and, 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 and I, I can't remember how I was explaining, but it was really interesting the way, and I, I said, well, I said, you know, I guess now the, the ones that say, you know, that plants aren't killing anything, the plants don't feel the pain now, they can't say that anymore. <laughs> I'd like to read that article. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can find it and give it to you. Thank you. But it, I think it relates to that, but I mean, just like the plants right. feel the pain, we feel that pain when, you know... That she's pruning up. Yeah, it's when we're, we're being pruned, we feel that pain. So we must be willing to pick up that cross daily. So that... And that, that is to live for him completely. It's more than just showing up to church and more than just saying I'm a Christian. The picking up the cross, the cross is an emblem of shame. A lot of people